Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome to the service of worship from the Aberdeen West Churches. A welcome to you from the congregations of Cults, Craigie Buckler, Manifield, Kings Wells, and Peter Cooter. I'd like to begin by reading a call to worship. Hold a mirror before us, O Lord. What image of ourselves is reflected back? Who do we see in the mirror? A version of who we are that is photoshopped to look better than it is? Or an image of who we are that fails to show the glory of the true created potential behind the grime of fault and weakness? It's so hard to see that we share similarities with the characters of the Bible who are flawed, yet also share in likeness with them the fact that nonetheless we are eternally under your love and mercy. Today let us find integrity in self-understanding and let us find comfort in the knowledge of your love for us. So let's worship God as we have our first hymn this morning. Take this moment, time and space. join with me today in our prayer of approach and confession. Let's pray. Loving God, we come as the prophets did because we are called to follow you. We come like the disciples before us because we are called to follow our Savior, Christ Jesus. We come as your beloved children from many different experiences and backgrounds, we who live within the world, who are striving ever to be for you, we come. We come in this time of change, in despair yet aware of emergent hope. Bless our lives as we seek to leave the darkness of fear and to walk into the light of hope. For we come as we are, confronted with our failings, in need of your care, to be comforted by your love. We come as we are, in need of forgiveness for what we have done and what we have failed to do. We come. Forgive us our constant distractions. 
choosing to focus on less important things because we think they are possible. Help us to realize that with you, all things are possible and that we may just be that catalyst to make the difficult more manageable. And we come giving thanks for your freely given grace. Thank you for your great mercy. Help us today and every day to seek your will, to know what it is to follow you, to walk in the footsteps of those who came before and to realize when we misstep. Help us to live like Jesus and to be strengthened in the spirit. We have been called loving God, so we come. And we join our voices together in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi there, everyone. It's good to be with you this week. And this week, I'd like us to think about something. And here's what I'd like us to think about. I'd like us to think about consequences. Now, I wonder if you've ever played the game consequences. The game where you're given the start of a sentence and you have to fill in a blank space. And then you turn the bit of paper over so that the next person can't see and they put something else in. And it goes on until you've been round everyone. And then at the end, you read the story and what the consequence was. And it's usually something really, really silly at the end of a very silly story. We all have consequences in life. And we know that if we do certain things, then there will be certain consequences. And here's a group of folk who've been in the news this week. It's the swimmers from Team GB who won the men's 4 by 200 metre relay race. They won a gold medal. Now, any athlete, any person will know that if you do a lot of hard exercise, there are going to be consequences. You may become breathless. You breathe much faster and possibly much deeper. Your heart rate will go up, so if you take your pulse, it would be beating very, very quickly. You may also become very hot and start to sweat. There are lots of things that can happen if you're exercising hard. And of course, for our Olympic swimmers and for other athletes at the Olympic Games in Tokyo just now, their hope is that when they perform, having done all the training and hard work, that the consequence will be they will win a medal, as our swimmers did and as others in Team GB have been doing over this past week. Now, if we choose to do something that's good, that's wise, then the consequence of that will be, I hope, a good consequence. Like crossing the road properly. Stop, look, listen, so that we can cross the road carefully. And if we stop, look and listen, we'll have a far better chance of being safe. If, however, you choose to do something foolish, like the man in this picture, who's sawing through a branch on a tree, but he's silly enough to be sitting on the bit of the branch that's going to fall down, then the consequences are that you might hurt yourself. And I think he might very well hurt himself once he's sawn all the way through that branch. That's a pretty silly thing to do. We all make decisions all of the time. 
and how we choose, what we choose to do when we make those decisions can actually help to shape our character. They can help to shape the kind of people we are. Here are some of the things that we might choose to do in our lives. We might choose to be selfish, unkind, greedy or cruel. And if we behave in those ways, then perhaps we will become selfish, unkind, greedy and cruel people. But then, on the other hand, we can choose to be friendly, encouraging, honest or loving. And when we choose to live like that, then we will become friendly, encouraging, honest and loving people. What we become will be a consequence of how we choose to live our lives. And in our Bible story this morning, we're hearing about David. He made choices in his life. He didn't always make the right choices. Sometimes he made mistakes, really terrible mistakes. But the things he chose to do had consequences for him and how we choose to live will have consequences for all of us. So let's choose to live lives a good way, the way that Jesus wants us to live. Thanks for listening, everyone.
Today's reading is from 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 26 through to verse 13 of chapter 12. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the mourning was over, David sent and, and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew with him, and with his children. It used to eat his meagre fare, and to drink from his cup, and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveller to the rich man, and was loath to take one of his flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who came to who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He, re he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. The second part of our reading follows from verse 7. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your house, and will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbour, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Amen. Good morning. Have you ever been told you're kidding yourself? I reckon that we've all had that at some point or other. Blackwood, you're kidding yourself if you think that homework is satisfactory. It's a fun phrase when we apply it to, say, school homework, but digging down deeper into the phrase, I think it contains an interesting question of philosophy. Is kidding ourselves a conscious or subconscious development and outcome? I'm thinking today about being true to ourselves, true to the image that God made us as, and the alternative, which is kidding around with who we are, not being true, but instead being something false, something other than who God meant us to be. This is all sparked off in my head because of the focus of our David story today. We've a rather deep and depressing story. On one hand, 
we see the failure of David as a person. It's revealed, not to us, because to be honest, we know already about David's misdeeds and we, we have been following his story in the last few weeks. But we reach a point where there is a moment of self-revelation for David, seeing himself for who he had become. Spill the beans for this week entitles the theme of this Sunday as David's shame. We see David morally bankrupt. His rape of Bathsheba, his deceit of Uriah, the events leading to Uriah's death. Then taking Bathsheba as his wife within mere days of her husband's death. David's is a story where power has gone to his head. He either believes that he can do what he wants, because he can, because he has the right to do so, and has consciously developed this reputation and authority, or he's doing what he likes because he's been so consumed by power, almost as if his subconscious has turned him into something despicable. Either way, consciously cultivating his aura of invincibility or unconsciously assuming it, he is kidding himself, becoming something he should not be, something that he is not meant to be. David feels no modicum of regret or guilt for his devious actions. This is a story of leadership that exists for itself. It is about power that has corrupted a person so much that their values have been lost. They now exist in their own wee world where everyone else is simply collateral damage there to help that person acquire for themselves what they want. We might recognise this from our modern day society. Now, I don't want to get too personal, but I, rather I invite you to consider who for you in national or global politics or multinational corporation business fits the bill of an individual or nation or group that thinks they can just get away with it. A group or individuals that rule or work from an agenda of seeking to overpower, take absolute control. Who work from a planned or unplanned script of style, outlook and application that becomes a kid on for, for the right that they have to behave and manipulate others like this. David is by the point of our lesson today morally at his lowest. Enter from stage left the prophet Nathan. Maybe he is there to save the day. Nathan's story is a masterpiece of inductive prophetic storytelling. He takes a bold and imaginative prophetic stance before King David that results in a changed mind. Rather than simply telling David where and how he had wronged God, Nathan conjured up a picture of the truth and he presented it to David. You see, Nathan wanted David to notice his errors his waywardness on his own without someone having to plainly tell him. This reminds me somewhat of Dickens' classic A Christmas Carol. The reader knows that Scrooge is a pretty mean character right from the start of the story. Scrooge either doesn't recognise this or he doesn't care. Dickens' ghosts 
do the work of Nathan in the story, presenting Scrooge's biographical life in such a way to Scrooge that he eventually recognises himself for what he had become, a monster. He didn't like what he, he saw. He'd been kidding himself. The ghosts show him who he really was and they open up for him the way to understanding. Understanding that if he actually wanted to be true to the potential of his created humanity, he needed to step out of the charade and instead allow to prosper that image within him for potential good. Lloyd Stephan, in an article entitled On Honesty and Self-Deception, You Are the Man, describes Nathan's prophetic task as the work of pulling David out of his self-deception. Stephan argues that Nathan is close enough to the situation, that he understands that David is someone who is self-deceived. There was for David an aha moment. Not because of Dave, Nathan's direct words of admonishment, but because of this way that Nathan presented the story in a way that David was able to see for himself what he had become. Swill the Beans has a, a monologue. So here, in the words of Nathan, is perhaps a good summary of the situation. You are the man. How did he think he was going to get away with it? He knows that God looks upon the heart. He knows that he will be forever hated by Bathsheba. He knows that if the truth came out, people would look at him differently. Yet, does he not care? Has he no shame? Has he become so surrounded by those who call out, you are the man, doffing their cap, bending the knee, overawed by his status and power, so much so that he no longer knows the truth or what is right or what is good. Displeased, yes, God, you and me both. But what to do about it? How to reveal the man to himself? A song, perhaps? He loves a good song. No, he knows I'm no songwriter. A speech, then? No, he would dismiss it before I even get the point. It needs to be something more subtle, a key to unlock the steely vault that has, that has entrapped his heart, a shard of light to break into the darkness, the darkness that has overcome his being. That's what I need. A parable, of course. That's what I need, a story. A situation so unjust that I can twist the knife of injustice deep into his heart before he knows even what I'm doing. And with a righteous cry, he says, I am the man. If we think the transformation of wicked Scrooge into generous, kind, Caris filled Scrooge was something special. In David's change of heart, the result of Nathan's intervention is miraculous. David confesses his sin, his sin against humanity and his sin against God. His life had become a sham. He was kidding himself into believing that he had a right to wield his authority and power in the way that he'd been doing for years and in the process resulting in terrible dehumanising outcomes. Who was he kidding? Clearly himself more than anybody else. This is not a story remembered simply for historical reasons, 
but because it has a lesson in it for our own humanity. It's a story that can be laid over countless real world examples from the way in the past that banks treated people during the financial crash decades ago now, to how multinationals can sue governments for laws that prevent them from making profit, from leadership of governments that create policies to suit their own personal investments. We see it in individual lives, sadly, all too often. Too often, some people are walked over by others who don't think twice and who don't flinch at the harm left in the wake of their manipulative ways. Nathan's story of injustice is a tale to tell again and again, a corrective for us all. We cannot let the weak and the marginalised, the vulnerable and the poor of this world be manipulated by the modern day Davids of our world. And we can't allow ourselves or the bodies that we represent to become the Davids of this time. We're, it's as if we're kidded ourselves into creating a version of ourselves and how we do things. A version that is not meant to be, that has not been created to be that. Nathan spoke truth to power. He did so in a clever way that caused David to ultimately convict himself. He spoke truth to power. Nathan speaks truth to you and to me and to the people and institutions of our time, calling us to take a long hard look at who we have become to take a look at the world that we've created and how we tolerate at times the actions of others that cause harm to the helpless who are caught in the wake of deceitful and callous activity. Again, the Bible brings us back to the point of reminding us of the value of God and the value that God places on the least and the powerless, the value that God has placed on those who, in secular terms, exist at the bottom of the league table in terms of gender or sexuality or wealth or colour or religion. The Bible brings us back, even in the midst of what is a horrid story of crime and consequences, of shame. It brings us back to the transformative power of God, to his unfailing mercy and love. We are always hopeful for turning points and the Bible supplies us with many turning points in large measure. Stories in which we see lives transformed by the mercy and grace and unfallible love of God. The Bible tells us many stories of those who have come to see who they had become and in deciding that they didn't like it and that it shouldn't be that way, made a concerted effort to change their ways. God called David through Nathan to see what he had become, to atone and put right, to see a reflection of himself that was the David that God saw him as. Not the version of David that he had become because of his objectives, because of his desires and his activities. God called David to see the potential of who he had been created to be. That David was almost not allowing birth to because of self-deceit. Instead, God called David to build and to feed, to live in and to prosper 
the man that God made him to be, not the man he had become. God calls us to become the best version of ourselves that he has made us to be. In fact, God commands that we become that person. Who are you kidding? Well, we can never kid God, although we can easily at times kid ourselves. We can't kid God. We need to become the person, the people, the man, the woman that God made us to be. We have been sanctified in Christ, the ultimate mercy of God. God has given us a pass to become the best version of ourselves that we can be. Amen. Please join me as we come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God in praise and in hope, with eyes open to the wonder of your grace, we present ourselves before you in this building, in our homes, apart in space but united in your love. Be among us today. Join us together in the radical spirit of change and new perspectives. Shine your light on the possibilities and the potential for a different way through you. As your church continues to discern our path forward, we ask for the boldness to hold what is good and overturn what blocks our path towards service of you and each other. We pray for those who bear the heavy burden of leadership, that they find the wisdom to serve all peoples. We pray for the isolated and the lonely, that they will find strength and comfort in you. We pray for all those who are ill, that they will find healing in your love. And on this day, as we strive to follow your son, Jesus, on the path of love for all, caring for ourselves and each other, help us to work, to see and to seek the change for which this world is so desperate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. brokenness, hope for despair. Lord, in the suffering, this is our prayer. Bread for the children, justice, joy, peace. Sunrise to sunset, your kingdom increase. Shelter for fragile lives, cure for their ills, work for the craftsmen, trade for their skills, land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak, voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor. Friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, the tears for thy brain. Come change our love from a spark to a flame. From cruel wars, havens from fear, cities for sanctuary, freedoms to share, peace to the killing fields, scorched earth to green, Christ for the bitterness, his cross for the pain. Change our love from us.
Now having worshiped together, been reminded of God's love and God's spirit that continues to guide us as individuals and as a community of faith, let us go into the world sharing that love with all whom we meet and trusting that God who is our creator, redeemer, and sustainer is with us this day and forevermore. Amen.